Hello, Oregon Prepared. Sorry that our time in Bend got cut short by weather, but I'd like to thank OEM for allowing me to share my presentation virtually. My name is Laura Hall. I'm originally from the Midwest, but I've lived in the Portland area for 23 years now. My family lives in North Portland, but we spend a lot of time at our cabin on Mount Hood, smack in the middle of a public safety power shutoff zone and surrounded by the risk of earthquake, volcano, wildfire, land movement, and flooding. My husband and I are responsible for children, elders, and pets. So like you, my work is both professional and personal. My day job is disaster messaging coordinator for the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization, or RDPO, which serves the five county Portland metro region. I'm here to talk to you about recent discussions that we've had with disaster vulnerable communities about how they interact with emergency information and what they want government agencies to do differently. For those of you who don't know about the RDPO, we're housed within the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, but we serve Clackamas, Columbia, Multnomah, and Washington counties in Oregon, as well as Clark County in Washington State. We've got it all. Urban, suburban, and rural, high, low, and no income, racial, ethnic, religious, and linguistic, homogeneity and diversity. But what is the RDPO? We're a partnership of government agencies, non-governmental organizations, community-based organizations, and private sector stakeholders working together to increase disaster resilience. We're mainly funded by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Urban Areas Security Initiative Grant Program, or UASI. We have a small staff of seven, but we keep a lot of regional work moving forward by supporting our partners and responding to their needs. Our focus is disaster preparedness, but if there's a large enough incident, like a global pandemic, some of our staff may also do some response work. For example, during COVID, I was the co-chair of the Portland region's joint information system. The RDPO has about a dozen discipline-specific work groups. They work on issues related to healthcare systems, radio interoperability, public works, debris management, volunteer training, you name it. I'm the chair of the disaster messaging work group, and I work very closely with our PIO and emergency alert and warning work groups. The disaster messaging work group meets monthly to discuss how disaster related communication works in our region and share our observations, opinions, and resources. We look at the big picture as well as specific products and specific issues. After each monthly meeting, all of the resources that we've collectively discovered in the previous month get compiled and added to our disaster messaging index, which people who don't attend our meetings, including you, could find on the RDPO website. There's a lot of great stuff there related to language and disability access, so I really encourage you to take a look. Most of our members represent city and county agencies, but we also have members from state agencies, 211info, community organizations, colleges and universities, and utility companies. We're working on a number of interesting projects, which I'm gonna tell you about in a little bit. Our goal is to ensure consistent, cohesive, accessible, and trauma-informed disaster messaging for our region. We use an equity lens in our work, constantly asking ourselves, Who's at the table to determine disaster messaging needs and content? How have historic and current injustices and inequities shaped this situation? How can we center our work in service to communities most impacted by disasters? And how can equity be embedded in our work and not an afterthought? But who are we talking about when we say those most impacted by disasters? In emergency management, there are many ways that we refer to people who experience social vulnerabilities. We might say underserved, underrepresented, marginalized, or even people disproportionately impacted by disasters. We might say people with access and functional needs or people with additional needs, but we don't have a shared definition of what that means. Even in FEMA materials, the definitions vary. Sometimes we list out individual categories of social vulnerability, and when we do, we almost always exclude someone. We've compiled this list from a wide array of sources, including FEMA, the CDC, local and national disability access and functional needs guidelines, and social vulnerability research. It's not a perfect list, but it does illustrate the complexity of what we're trying to boil down into simple words. 
Here's a shortened version. I keep both lists posted next to my computer so I can look at them while I'm working to keep at the forefront of my mind whose experiences and challenges I need to learn more about and integrate into my work. I've begun to use the term disaster vulnerable to describe communities that routinely, statistically experience disproportionate impacts of disasters. This is a term that I've seen in current research from the Natural Hazard Center, which is a global leader in studying vulnerability to disasters. But the word vulnerable can be problematic. So when using the term disaster vulnerable, we must recognize that while certain groups are more vulnerable to disasters, they also have a wide array of strengths and capacities. They are not innately vulnerable people, but our society is structured in a way that makes them more vulnerable to disasters. In 2021, we launched a project called Community Engagement Lessons Learned, or CELL. Alice Bush from Multnomah County was the project manager. We gathered about 60 people from 41 community-based organizations, CBOs, that represent a wide variety of communities. I'll use those abbreviations moving forward. CELL is the project and CBOs are the people. We asked the CBOs questions about their experience with disaster messaging over the past few years during a number of major incidents, pandemic wildfire heat and other events that we had recently experienced. We asked them questions like, where did you get information during a, a disaster or emergency? What's your opinion of that information? And how did you share that information about those disasters with your community? What they shared is specific to certain communities in the Portland metro region, but I would wager that there are people in your area who have similar feelings. Here's some of what we learned. Unsurprisingly, we heard a lot of frustration. Important messages aren't reaching isolated, disaster vulnerable communities. Most government messaging isn't translated or isn't translated into enough languages. ASL videos are rarely available and other basic disability access features are often overlooked. Many government messages aren't written in plain language and are presented in formats that are not friendly to neurodiverse minds and people with low literacy. These are things that are required by law. Often there's either way too much information presented in a way that's visually overwhelming or there's too little information so people don't have access to important details. Visual materials aren't created using basic user interface design standards, which is just a fancy way of saying there's little attention given to the way people navigate information. We also heard that there's too much noise. People often don't know where to look for accurate, timely, reliable information. Here's an example. If there's a wildfire, information might be coming from the city, county, or state communication offices. It might also be coming from emergency managers, the sheriff for police, fire, fire marshal. If there are road closures, Department of Transportation might be sending messages. Public health might be messaging about smoke impacts. Uh, the Water Bureau might have messages about water safety or the DEQ might. Utilities might be out and they're going to have their own messaging. And sometimes you have all of these offices sending out messages at the city, county, and state level. Fortunately, the state of Oregon now has a wildfire website. which is a great first step to simplifying communication for this type of disaster. Government lanes of responsibility are confusing and often uncoordinated, not to mention the many other agencies and organizations that are messaging to the public during a disaster. This isn't all bad. We do want some redundancies and messages that speak to different audiences. But what we're hearing is we don't care about your jurisdictional or disciplinary lanes. When it comes to a disaster and information from the government, we want one clear place to go to look for information and we want it to be accessible for all members of our community. This problem is true before disasters as well. These are California examples, but I could easily find examples in Oregon. Within each branch of government, you sometimes have dozens of individual offices creating preparedness websites, and then you add on the websites of the federal agencies, colleges, universities, nonprofits, private institutions, blah, 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 blah. All told, there are hundreds of websites in each state that offer preparedness information. Some have local content, which is great because one of the best things we can do is give people information about how to get help when they need it. But on the whole, all of this creates a confusing array of messages that are overwhelming, inconsistent, and sometimes conflicting. 
our communities don't know how to navigate this and they don't want to. They want us to work together to simplify things. Okay, we also heard about culture and trauma. So I'm gonna show you some materials from the state of Oregon, but I wanna say first that this is, like, this is a very important learning process. And this is not a roast, I'm not here to criticize people, but I'm gonna show you a few examples of messages that try to use humor and heartstrings to prompt behavior change. Bigfoot, we love him. Now look at this and put yourself in the shoes of someone who doesn't know what Bigfoot is how it applies to preventing wildfires, and what the heck this has to do with footprints. This would be nonsensical and possibly terrifying. Like, are there giant, hairy, lumpy creatures walking around the mountains? This is an attempt to be lighthearted, but it's really only serving people with the cultural capital to understand it. Humor's really tricky in public safety messaging. Now look at this one and tell me how you would feel if you had lost a loved one a child to a wildfire. Or maybe you lost all of your possessions. Terrifying, traumatic. Research tells us that fear-based messaging does not work for prevention. And after all that we've collectively been through in the past few years, it's really not appropriate now. Our work group has begun using the term trauma-informed disaster messaging. The concept of trauma-informed care is pretty clear at this point but it doesn't seem to exist in literature or best practices around disaster messaging, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned about it. We should always be asking ourselves, what would I think or how would I feel if I saw or heard this and I was fill in the blank, new to this country or region, a disaster or trauma survivor, a person with no home or income, a person with a disability, a renter, etc. You get my drift. All right, other things that we heard. Many people, especially older folks, people in rural areas and people new to an area, turn to TV and radio during a disaster, but they often aren't getting the information they need. Broadcasters usually send people to their own websites where they encourage lots of clicking around, but they don't provide sufficient information about how to stay safe and get help. And it's only in English and sometimes really important information is hidden behind a paywall. When it comes to preparedness messaging, local media usually send people to ready.gov, which lacks critical local information like where to get help. And it sometimes conflicts with our local priorities like being prepared for two to three days versus two or more weeks. Also, while they are making some improvements, ready.gov does not meet the RDPO's language and disability access standards. And many communities don't see themselves represented in their materials. Plus, these are the images that they're using to explain common hazards. Personally, I think these images are terrifying and not helpful. They're not motivating to anyone who's feeling overwhelmed and on the fence about digesting this information. This is not trauma-informed. Our partners also told us that many community members don't use mainstream communication channels. We know that many are distrustful of the government, sometimes for very good reasons. More and more people are communicating through an array of instant messaging services. These are especially popular in certain immigrant communities. For example, a large number of Somali speakers aren't literate in English or their native tongue, but they can use these apps to digest audio, video, and imagery. The good news is we don't have to pivot to using all of these tools. And in fact, it usually wouldn't work because we wouldn't know where to plug in. But we have community partners that work daily in disaster vulnerable communities and they know how to reach the people in those communities. They are trusted partners and they know a lot more than we ever will about their community's culture, language, and background, which brings me to the next lesson that our project confirmed. Our community partners want to help us disseminate life safety information. They want to share knowledge of disaster vulnerable communities. They want to help us plan and help us respond during an event, but they don't wanna be bombarded by dozens and dozens of public agency priorities. Nearly every office and nearly every government organization, local, state, and federal is trying to get community input on their work. And that is overwhelming many CBOs and irritating them. That being said, they don't want us to overgeneralize. 
We shouldn't stop inviting them to the table. They just want us to communicate with each other and get organized and deconflict public agency efforts. They also want to be fairly compensated for participating in public agency work. So giving us feedback on projects and programs and providing guidance on how to communicate with the communities they represent, specific language and cultural information, and other government mission focused work. We had some pretty robust discussions with our cell partners about whether and how much CBO representatives should be paid for their time and expertise. And I wanna pause here because we've heard a number of very skeptical responses to the concept of paying a CBO. And I'd like to share some of my thoughts. We've heard questions like, why would we pay community representatives to participate in disaster preparedness and response work? Because they have the potential to save lives by sharing their expertise with us. They know their communities and often their communities trust them way more than us. Also, they're professionals. We compensate contractors with subject matter expertise that we don't possess. We don't ask them to volunteer their time and expertise. But this is for the greater good. Don't they want to help their communities? Yes, of course they do. And almost everything that government agencies are asking, asking them to give input on has the potential to help or hurt their communities. Remember, they're being bombarded. Well, can't they just consider disaster preparedness and response part of their day job? Maybe, maybe not. They're often funded by grants or foundations with very specific missions. So in order to participate and work outside of that mission, they might have to volunteer their time. Why can't they just volunteer their time? I do. Not everyone has that luxury. Most CBO staff are extremely busy and usually vastly underpaid for the vital services they provide to communities. Staff might work multiple jobs and or have families to care for outside of their normal business hours. But if we pay them to participate, won't they just come to expect it? And what if they're trying to take advantage of it? Greed and corruption are not traits I would assign to any of the community representatives I have ever met. They're generous, ethical people who have chosen to direct their energy to helping people, and they're not looking to get rich quick. The fear of this possibility is not a valid reason to deny compensation for services rendered. And finally, my agency doesn't have a budget for this. I hear you, most don't, but that won't change unless we all agree it should. Policy change needs champions. I'm eternally grateful for the champions at OEM and OHA who are addressing this issue and exploring ways to ethically include community organizations in public agency work. This is great for our local jurisdictions. By far, the most time consuming and frustrating part of the cell project was navigating the maze of government procurement systems, paying our CBO contractors for their vital contributions was hard, but it was also very much worth it. They showed up, they participated in robust discussions and they informed a ton of our future work. Also, I just wanted to tell you that what we heard from them was deep gratitude and excitement. They were really happy to be asked very specific questions about disaster related messaging. And they learned a lot about how the government side of disaster preparedness and response works. We know this is confusing. Cities, counties, special districts, utilities, state federal offices, they all have pieces of a large and complex system. And CBOs have to interact with that system during disasters without much or any guidance on how it works. Which silo to consult for answers? Okay, moving on. There was another major theme in the cell project. We heard them say that they don't understand emergency alert and warning systems, but they desperately want to because they know that the systems are delivering critical life safety information and that they often don't serve their communities very well. We wanted to know more about that, so we created a follow up project called Accessible Alert and Warning Workshops, which was designed by Alita Fitz from Washington County. The goal here was two way learning building trust and improving our understanding of how to better create messages that disaster vulnerable communities will pay attention to, understand, act on quickly and not be traumatized by. Again, we worked with a wide variety of community partners. There were 51 participants from 30 CBOs. 
We started with an orientation during which we gave a primer on emergency alert and warning systems, how the government notifies the public during an emergency, why we sometimes use emergency alerts, who sends them and when, and an explanation of the differences between wireless emergency alerts, emergency alert system, and opt-in alerts, including how they look and sound and how to ensure you can receive them, but also their limitations. Next, we hosted four-hour workshops. We gave them an evacuation scenario and asked them to write an alert using st standard character limits. We listened and we watched as they struggled with how to shape the messages and then debriefed to learn more about their thought processes and how their approach applied to the communities they represent. Then we showed them a number of real life alerts and asked them for their feedback. And finally, we talked about very specific elements of alerts, specific words, phrases, acronyms, URLs, jurisdiction names, etc. Here are just a few examples of what we heard. First, we heard a strong preference for starting alerts with the word alert, emergency, wildfire, or another plain language word that grabs their attention instead of leading with the sending agency's name. Now this is in direct conflict with research-based best practices and IPAWS trainings. We think the contradiction might have something to do with the demographics of research participants. Some communities have negative associations with government. Some might not recognize the name or abbreviation of the sending agency, which could be related to language or just being new, or new to or unfamiliar with an area. Plus, there's an increasing hesitancy to engage with anything that could be spam. So people might not even open a text or email that starts with an abbreviation or a county name that they don't recognize. We also heard strong preferences for avoiding commonly used words like hazmat and hazardous materials in favor of actual descriptors like chemical explosion or gas leak. And very few of our participants said they would click on a bit.ly link, which is an approach some alerting authorities do use. And none of our participants said that they would click on the jumbled link that Everbridge automatically creates when a message gets truncated. I wanna say that this project was not an official research study, but I've done official research and I think we did a really good job of designing the workshops and codifying the results. We would love to see this work replicated on a larger scale. Actually, a nonprofit in San Jose replicated the project a few weeks ago, and they got nearly identical answers from their participants. We, we also hope to see the national research community dig in on some of this stuff, ensuring a diverse set of participants based on disaster vulnerability. So that would include things like language, disability, immigration status, and housing status, things that we've not seen represented in national research which tends to consider only race, gender, and income. The third project I'd like to share with you is one that originated during the devastating June 2021 heat dome, which killed 69 people in Multnomah County alone and sent hundreds more to emergency rooms. First, some background. The city of Portland has a very active co-ad group, Community Organizations Active in Disasters. It has over 250 members from about 120 organizations. Some only serve Portland and Multnomah County, but many serve the entire region or the entire state of Oregon. They meet monthly to discuss disaster preparedness training, funding opportunities, and continuity of operations planning. But during an emergency, they meet almost daily to coordinate. A city staff member, Kate Strom, provides administrative and facilitation support for the group. Her position gives the co-ed consistency and allows it to remain active during disasters. She also acts as a wonderful liaison between the co-ed and the appropriate government offices, but the co-ed work is driven by the co-ed members. When the heat dome hit, co-ed partners hopped on a call and shared strong opinions about the heat related messaging that was being shared by government agencies. It was not meeting their community's needs. They said, the messages make assumptions about age, ability, income, housing status, literacy level, and culture. They are not in plain language and often use idioms like beat the heat. Too many materials lack translation. When translations are there, there's usually only a few languages or they're inaccurate or incorrect. Graphic images overwhelmingly represent young, white, middle-class, non-disabled people. 
Uh, too frequently, the images are disturbing, inaccurate, confusing, not instructive, show what we people we, we don't want people to do instead of what we do want them to do. Um, the images lack alternative text for screen readers, have poor color contrast, and are only available in colors and formats that don't print well on low quality black and white printers, which many of them are using. Also, the materials are usually provided in PDF format, which means they can't be easily edited, and they include government logos. Even if it's a public health document, many don't differentiate between the different branches or departments of a government. Uh, also, some community members who have low literacy or can't read English rely on social media apps like WhatsApp or WeChat for sharing audio messages, but audio versions of heat safety messages were extremely hard to find. So problem solver that she is, Kate created the Critical Safety Messages Project, which addresses all of these concerns. You can visit publicalerts.org slash messaging hyphen tools to view messages in 26 languages. Copyright free images that represent a wide variety of people and have appropriate color contrast and alt text, audio files of key messages, flyers, and even videos. Community engagement liaisons representing an array of disaster vulnerable communities have provided input and feedback on the materials. We've completed extreme heat and winter weather messages and we're currently working on wildfire and smoke and have, hope to have those available for all of you soon. They're free and open to anyone anywhere. The work has been extremely well received by our community and public partners, both locally and nationally. We hope to keep editing and adding to the library as we're able to, and we hope that our national partners will join us in this effort. These are evergreen messages that don't really change much from year to year. And this approach is inclusive and equity focused. We see little reason why this work shouldn't be a priority. There are a few other projects I'd like to share with you real quickly. As I mentioned, community partners said there's too much noise in disaster messaging. So instead of each city, county, special district, and organization creating and marketing their own preparedness website, we have a regional website, publicalerts.org. It provides a one-stop shop for accurate disaster-related information. Here you can sign up for alerts, view current alerts, learn about hazards uh, and preparedness, volunteer opportunities, and information about disaster recovery. During an emergency, we update the site with event-specific information, like where to go for shelter, who to call for help, and we point people to the appropriate local websites for much of that information. We're building brand recognition right now so that our communities know to turn here first and then they can be redirected to the appropriate places. There's only one URL they need to know. The website was designed by dozens of subject matter experts and has evolved as we have received community input. It has what we think is a clean, simple design so that it doesn't overwhelm people, but it contains a treasure trove of links for anyone who wants to dig deep and get answers. I know most of you know how hard it is to work within the boundaries of a government website. You have very little control over layout and appearance. This website was designed on Drupal and we have total control over it. It can handle massive spikes in traffic and it has dark pages loaded and ready to activate during an incident. No single jurisdiction in our region could have created this alone. This website highlights cross-cutting disaster themes, evacuation, shelter in place, power outage, and individual preparedness for individual needs. It's inclusive, it represents many kinds of people and many different types of communities, rural, urban, suburban. It's undergone a thorough manual, not automated disability audit. It's written at a sixth grade reading level or lower Words were chosen very carefully to ensure more accurate automated translations and sensitivity to diverse cultures. And it aims to motivate through encouragement and collectivism. You'll also remember that our cell project participants said that local media is a default source of information for many disaster vulnerable communities. This summer, the RDPO is meeting with editors and reporters from top regional TV and radio media outlets to discuss disaster messaging. The goals are to let them know what we've heard and seen, as well as our concerns about specific populations being dependent upon local media for life safety information, and to build relationships and create a feedback loop between local media reporters, emergency managers, and community-based organizations. We'll also be talking with broadcast engineers and operating managers 
to work through some important technical and accessibility issues with the emergency alert system so we can ensure that TV and radio alerts are as effective as possible. The last project I want to share with you is something we've been slowly packing away at for several years, but recent events have really underscored how necessary it is. And we recently got funding to complete the project. So currently in our region, you know, most jurisdictions have some kind of general communication standards and some have some very disaster specific communication guidance, but it's very rare. Most jurisdictions have some kind of language and disability access standards, or at least direct people to national laws and guidance. Um, some jurisdictions have some very clearly articulated um, standards and some even have guidance on how to meet the standards. But too frequently, one has to go digging around for all the pieces that they need to address all of the necessary elements. And what we want is a comprehensive guide that articulates our shared values, goals, and standards and provides easy to access and digest and guidance and tools for meeting the standards. We've got many hundreds of people in the region doing public messaging during disasters. We've got the PIOs, the, um, sometimes PIOs in relevant offices like transportation, water, public works, etc. We've got emergency alert and warning professionals, just many, many hundreds. Not to mention the other people doing this work outside of the government sphere. Many of those people don't have in-depth training in language and disability access and cultural responsiveness. And given the huge number of people that includes and turnover and the infrequency of training opportunities, it's extremely unlikely we'll ever see all of our disaster communicators having this important training. Plus, most of our partners work with vendors on creative assets, and those vendors usually lack that in-depth in knowledge and skill as well. They need to be told exactly what is expected of them in these areas, so that's what we're working on. Our regional disaster messaging standards will provide a suite of resources that organizations of all sizes and scope can use. It will give guidance on applying local and federal laws, current disaster and social vulnerability research, crisis and emergency risk communication standards, and lessons learned from our recent community engagement projects. For example, it'll have some really easy to, to digest quick reference tools and checklists for plain language, language access, disability access in web, print, audio, video, and social media, tone, style, visual and conceptual representation, inclusive language, social vulnerability indices, and engagement and reimbursement of community-based organizations. So yes, most of these tools already exist. All of them already exist. So we'll do an environmental scan to avoid recreating the wheel. Uh, we already know that OHA, Work and Health Authority, and partners in California and Seattle have some awesome, wonderful tools that we can draw from. If you know of any other excellent resources, we'd love to hear from you. And if you'd like to learn more about or critique anything that I've presented here, please reach out. I'd love to talk about it. I'd also love to chat about the amazing groups that I participate in that are helping advance equity in emergency management and disaster messaging, including a new national work group that we co-founded last year called Language and Accessibility and Alert and Warning Work Group. Uh, also, the State of Oregon Scrap Committee that, that works on best practices and alert and warning and creates plain language templates for the OR alert system. And finally, OHA's fantastic ESF8 Community of Practice group, led by the incomparable Jamie Bash. Uh, her group brings together public health PIOs and others that are working on disaster communication issues in the state of Oregon. Highly recommend joining that group. I'd like to thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you all in person one day. And thanks again to OEM for putting this all together.